Hello everyone, and uh, thanks for being here at this talk entitled Android Puzzlers, Traps, Pitfalls, and Corner Cases. First, I'd like to thank uh, all of the organization of Android Makers. It's always a pleasure to be here, especially in this big room where it would be a perfect place to look at Avengers Endgame, but you will not be watching this movie. We will talk about Android Puzzlers today. Uh, my name is Cyril Motier, and I'm uh, working at Zenly, a Snapchat company based in, in Paris. By the way, uh, we are hiring, so if you are an Android or iOS developer looking for uh, good challenges, uh, feel free to, to uh, come after the talk and see me and talk to me. So if you are familiar with the talks I, I've done, uh, well, I've been talking pretty much at Android Makers and before that, DroidCon Paris, uh, about subjects that are related to Android. I'm always trying to pick, you know, um, a, a core subject of, of Android, like state restoration or last year themes and styles. But this year, I was like, maybe I can do something different, something that is not related to a particular subject. And I wanted to talk about puzzlers. Um, so. Just like, just like Florina talked about yesterday at the, at the keynote, I'm going to talk basically about those what the fuck moments. You know, I've been working on Android for more than 10 years now, uh, at least 10 years, uh, because I actually started with the early loop, so pre uh, 1.0 of Android. And uh, so it was a long time ago, and I faced a lot of what the fuck moments. And, and those what the fuck moments are pretty much the content of this, um, of this um, talk. So puzzlers are not something that I've created. I mean, it's something that is pretty common. And actually, as far as I know, it's been introduced by uh, two people called Joshua Block and uh, Neil Gafter in their book called Java Puzzlers. Uh, and in this book, you basically have some samples of uh, some sample code of Java. You look at the code, you expect one output, and when you execute it, well, you have a different output. And that's basically what we will be doing in this talk, all right? Um, they also did actually a, a bunch of Google uh, I.O. conferences. Um, and more recently, I've seen the exact same kind of, of talks for Python, for Ruby, and more recently, Kotlin. So I was like, why not for Android? Because Android, well, is pretty large too, and I'm pretty sure that we can find some, some, some puzzlers like this. So what's a puzzler? If we had to uh, visualize a puzzler, that would be the visual representation. Don't worry, I won't stick to that slide too much time. Uh, but normally, when you look at this picture, I don't know, if because the screen is pretty big, but when I look at this picture on my screen, I've got the impression that everything is moving. But that's actually only your mind tricking you, right? It's, it's not moving at all. It's a static image. And this is what we're going to do in this talk. So what's an Android puzzler? So contrary to Kotlin puzzlers or Java puzzlers, where you only have like a very small portion of code, uh, for Android, you have a small application. Um, but as you know, in computer science, it's always difficult to simplify things because, well, we're always trying to build complex stuff. So I've reduced as much as possible the, um, the, the, the code uh, to avoid the it depends answer, right? Um, I've also reviewed the code as much as possible. I've restricted the code as much as possible. So I hope there is no error in this in this slides. Uh, but please forgive me if there is an error. But uh, at least I've executed everything on my mobile phone to make sure that uh, the, the output is what I've what uh, what is uh, in in real life. So each puzzle will be uh, split into three parts. The first part will be to look at the code. So we will look together at the code, we will analyze it, we will try to find out what it prints, obviously. Uh, and then we will have multiple uh, answers, right? At least four answers. Uh, so I will ask for you for the solution. Uh, and uh, if you answer it right, uh, you will have a goodie. So there is two people uh, on the uh, on the border of the of the room that can give you some goodies. So if you answer uh, correctly, you will get you will get a goodie. And then, because well, you have four answers, so you can pick one and just be lucky. Uh, you also um, will be able to uh, give the actual answer and why this is the result that we are having uh, as a, as an output. So yeah, th this is like a too much goodies exception. But feel feel free to to answer whatever you want actually, because even if you don't answer it correctly, you will you will get a goodie. I have too much and I don't want to bring them back at home. So how can we do something simple? So we will all uh, we have nine nine 
so nine, this is nine, this is not nine. Uh, we have nine different puzzlers, and to make sure that um, we always try to have like a very simple uh, application, we will all always have the exact same build.gradle file. Um, there are some particular cases when, where I will modify this Gradle file, but I will warn you just before the puzzler, obviously. So if you look at this uh, Gradle file, it's a very simple application, like, like the Hello World application. So we have a, an application that is using Kotlin and Kotlin Android extensions that is using the compile SDK version 28, so the latest public one, obviously we have a, a new version with, which is a preview, but it's not 28 or 29. Uh, and the minimum SDK and the target SDK are once again 28. So no, no weird, you know, retro compatibility or no weird behavior based on only on the fact that it's running either on an old version of the platform or a new version of the platform. And if you look at the dependency list, you only have the standard library from Kotlin, right? Uh, 1.3.21. Actually, the version of Kotlin here shouldn't change anything. But if you want to know everything, yeah, it's 1.3.21. And for all of these applications, we will use this exact same uh, Android manifest. So the application, once again, is fairly simple. Only one uh, activity. In, 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 the, in the application. Um, the application is labeled with uh, app name. It has no backup. It supports RTL. And the theme is Android column uh, theme.material.light.docactionbar. Um, Here, I don't have a compat because, well, we're really focusing on Android vanilla, right? And the activity is always called main activity. And it's the main activity, uh, basically, of the, uh, of the um, the, the puzzler or the sample application. So if we sum up all of this, we target, we compile, and we min SDK 28. We're running on 28, obviously, because we have no other choice. Uh, all warnings, errors, and lints have been disabled. And we will be mainly focusing on, on vanilla Android. I'm saying mainly because there was w one use case where I will be talking about fragments. And obviously, when you talk about fragments, you have to uh, use Android X. But I will say at this time. So let's start with a very simple puzzler, which is called inflation result. So here is the code I have. So I have a, um, an activity in this onCreate method. I create a frame layout, which, is, which has a, ta a tag called parent, right? And then I, I do inflate two, uh, two times at the same view. In the first case, uh, I will inflate view, uh, inflate passing the parent as the second parameter. And then the second one, I will pass null at the second parameter. And then I will display the tag from result one and result two. And if I look at the, the, the layout definition, it's basically just a text view that is sized to match the parent and has a tag set to child. So here are the possible answers. Is the answer uh, A, which will be child and child? Is the answer B, parent and child? Is the answer C, throws null pointer exception? Or here's the answer, the answer D. <laughs> that might help. So do we have, yeah, Maria. So what's the answer? Yes, B, exactly. You are a, you're, you, you're a pretty experienced Android developer, but everybody knows that. Yeah, the answer is B, because actually the result of uh, inflate depends on the second, the nullability of the second argument of inflate. So if we look at the table, basically, uh, whenever you pass null, you will always get the child. And if you pass a non-null root, you will get not the child, but the parent. But you have also an extra addition uh, behavior that will be done, which is the, the, the child will be added to the parent. So in general, please try to avoid this two arg method and favor the three arg method. Be explicit about whether you want to attach to the parent and whether you want to return or not um, the child or the parent. So if we look at this method, um, when you look at the table, it will always return the child uh, when you have a null root, and it will always return the child if you have attached to root set uh, to false. But still, we have like the bottom line that uh, indicates that if you pass a non-null parent, a non-null root, but you set attached root to true, then you will still get the parent, 
which is kind of weird, and you have an extra uh, behavior, which is that the view will be added to the parent. So in general, I strongly recommend you to always pass attached to root to false, which will always make sure that the, 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 extra, the extra behavior is not done. And at the same time also, I would all highly suggest to always par pass the parent, no null parent, because when you pass a null parent for the layout inflator, it's not possible to compute the layout parents necessary for the child. So in general, I strongly recommend you to, to pass a non null parent, uh, then uh, attached to root set to false. And if you want to get uh, this view attached to the parent, then simply call add view on the parent with that child. But the thing is, you will always return the child in that case, and then you can do whatever you want on the inflated view. So congratulations for that, Maria. So that one was easy, but let's deep, deep, uh, go deeper, actually. Let's talk about padding precedence. So here is the code. Uh, I hope you can see it. Uh, so we have a, a very fairly simple activity once again. We just set the content view to activity main, and then we trace, uh, we trace, sorry, uh, padding start, padding top, padding end, and padding bottom of a view called uh, text. Let's look at the um, let's look at the layout. Uh, here, we have just a text view with uh, which is sized uh, to match the parent, but we have a background, which is padded rect. We have a, some padding, padding bottom, padding end, horizontal, left, right. Starts so a lot of padding in here, and actually, if you look at the drawable, there is also some padding inside the drawable. This one is trickier, right? So, what would be the answer? Would it be A, start five, top five, and five, bottom five, which would mean basically that Android column padding is as the highest precedence? Would it be B, padding, then padding start or end, then padding left? top right bottom would it be c start two uh, top four and three and bottom one which would mean that the system is actually using the padding from the drawable or would it be d not the answer d but start 11 top five and seven bottom five which would mean that the, the system is applying first padding left top right bottom then padding and then uh, padding start or end so a b c or d At the front. So the answer is A. The answer is A? Yeah. Are you sure of that? Uh, Do you want a goodie? No, yeah, sure. You will get a goodie, but you don't have the correct answer. <laughs> the answer is D. <laughs> That's actually weird. Um, and, and why? Do you know why? What's the precedence uh, list or the order of precedence of padding? Well, actually, it depends on one thing. So we are in the it depends case. So if we have supports RTL set to false, but this is not the case, remember, in this application, then the system will first apply drawable uh, padding first, then padding start and end, then padding left, top, right, bottom, then padding horizontal and vertical, and then padding. So in that case, that would be true. But we're not in that case. We're actually supports RTL set to true. So in that case, padding start and end are actually applied at the very highest precedence. So it's something that is always disturbing because we're used to having padding always having the highest precedence, but that's not the case when you support RTL equal true. And that's actually because the system has to resolve start and end based on the other paddings, and that's because uh, of this reason that uh, padding start and end are always applied at, at the end uh, when, you support RTL, um, uh, uh, when you support RTL. Just a quick reminder, by the way, on horizontal and, and vertical padding. I don't know if you were rare, aware of it. It's actually pretty new because it's been introduced in API 26. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't use it. Actually, you can use it because APT2 is backporting it. Uh, but it's backporting it to left and right, right? It's not backporting it to start and, and end. A second pu uh, third puzzler, sorry, is about activity lifecycle. So we all know about this. Activity lifecycle. It's so simple, uh, so much callbacks. So here is the code, fairly simple. Uh, on create, on start, on resume, on pause, on stop, and on destroy. All those methods are actually tracing the name of the callback. And but in on create, we we trace, uh, we trace, sorry, the on create, and then we finish it, and we trace finish. 
So what would be the answer for you? I would it be A on create? Well, you finished, so let's stop. It, would it be B on create, then finish, then all of the life cycle up to and destroy? Would it be C on create, on stop, on resume, on pause, on stop, or on destroy? Would it be D on create, finish, and on destroy? We have someone there, uh, Marion, there. Yeah. Maybe you can just yell. I think it would be D. Would be D? Exactly. Yeah. You get two, two goodies because we have <laughs> a lot of them. Exactly. And do you know, does anybody know why? Someone else, maybe on the, at the right of the, of the room because we have uh, more goodies at the right of the room. <laughs> yeah, at the, at the top. Please run, Romain. I have a lot of puzzles. I think that I think that because uh, finish is called uh, directly and and then the the callback to and destroy is called uh, just after. Yes, so kind of actually. So we always have the duality of the callback. So it it cannot be like just on create and it, there would be finish at least. Uh, otherwise, it would mean that finish returns nothing, which is not the case in the API. But at least yeah, there is like a fast pass. Uh, in the in the system to avoid going through the on start on resume on pause and on, on stop uh, methods because it it pointless. So actually, this is very counterintuitive because when we think about the activity lifecycle, we always think about this uh, well diagram. But if you look at this diagram and the documentation that is associated to this diagram, it's written that the following diagram shows the important state path of an activity. It doesn't mean that this diagram is exhaustive. And actually, we have a fairly, fairly, um, a fairly simple example uh, of this in that particular case. So never consider this diagram as exhaustive. Uh, actually, this diagram is really like working in all cases, regardless of the API version that you're using. So always think about it. Let's now talk about Drawable. So this is a subject that I love. I think this is the first talk I've done like 10 years ago. It was about Drawable. So I love this abstraction of something that can be rendered on screen. Um, but because Drawables are nice, there are also some caveats inside and traps. And uh, in particular, because Drawables have been here for a long, long time, actually more than, more than 10 or 12 years, because it was here since the, the first day of Android. So here is the code just creating like a list of, of uh, three references to drawable definitions. And then we map that to get drawable uh, class Java simple name. So basically we just extract the name of the class that has been inflated and retrace that using join to string from the standard um, lib of Kotlin. If we look at the definition, level list is just level dash list uh, uh, root uh, tag. If we look at layer list, layer dash list, and if we look at the shape uh, XML, it's just a shape XML root tag. So what would be the answer? Would it be A, level list drawable, layer list drawable, and then shape drawable? Would it be B, level drawable, layer list drawable, shape drawable? Would it be C, level list drawable, layer drawable, but gradient drawable? Or would it be D, throws inflate exception, because, well, this definition of Drawable might not be like correct or uh, executable or possible. We have here, Romain. C? Exactly, it's C, yeah. Which is completely counterintuitive because you expect to have like the exact same XML uh, tag used for the naming of the class. But this is just the general rule. So if you have like a tag called like, for instance, Valar Morgulis, then you can expect Valar Morgulis drawable um, to be inflated. And that's actually pretty, pretty okay or pretty right for a lot of tags. So these are all of the tags that you can inflate and you will get exactly the same name with drawable uh, at the end. But it's, there are some exceptions. And actually the first exceptions are for selector, which will be stateless instead of selector. So for selector, we will have stateless drawable. Same for an embedded selector. 
uh, we have some cases with lists where you don't have the list, like layer list, like just like we've seen in animation list. And finally, the weirdest one is shape, which will not create a shape durable, but a gradient durable. So nothing in common between the XML, XML tag and the, uh, the, the durable that has been inflated. And this is weird also because we're in the API, there is a shape durable. But this shape durable cannot be inflated via XML. It's just part of the API, just like paint durable or picture durable, but it's not possible to inflate it via, via, um, via XML. And the thing is, I, I looked at the Git history to, to understand that, and actually I, I've been at the root of the Git history and there is no answer to that, but I suspect that actually the, the, the first version of Androids uh, were actually uh, using shape to inflate a shape durable, because if you look at the code of shape durable, all of the code is here to inflate the shape durable from XML, but there is no tag associated to shape durable. In the case of picture durable, well, this is something that is not inflatable via XML because if you look at the, um, the class, it's really meant to be used at runtime, so it doesn't mean anything to, to be inflated via XML. Another funny point is that there is another tag that you can use, which is animated rotate, which is possible via XML, but there is no associated class because it's hidden. Actually, it's not part of the public API. So if you want to use animated rotate, you can. You have all of the attributes in the uh, r.attr, but you can't, you can't uh, get the class. And finally, starting API 24, uh, just as a quick reminder, you can use your own dribble by using the full name, uh, and then you will have your own dribble created. Obviously, this only works if you are uh, inflating it from your own process and not you know, passing this dribble, for instance, to the notification manager, because otherwise it won't work. Let's now continue on fragment lifecycle. So this is the, the, you know, the exception I've told you about at the beginning. So in that case, because we are using fragment, we will be importing uh, Android X fragment. And we have a tracing fragment, which basically is similar to what we've done for the lifecycle of the activity, just displays um, a bunch of, of, call of callbacks for on attach, on create, on create view, on destroy view, on destroy, on detach. And then we do that in the main activity. So we have two transactions. The first one will add a tracing fragment uh, to the UI, and the second transaction will detach this fragment from, from the UI. And to make the, the puzzle simpler, I've uh, specially enforced the fact that we don't have state restoration. So it's always like in the situation of a cold start, right? So what for you is the correct answer. Is it A, on attach, on create, on create view, on this on destroy view, on destroy, and on detach? Is it B, on, on attach, on create, on destroy view, on create view, sorry, and on destroy view? Is it C, on create, on destroy? Or is it D, nothing? Maybe because they are, well, the system knows that we are we are adding and detaching stuff, so maybe there is nothing to do. Does anybody want to answer that one? Uh -huh. Nobody used fragment, right? <laughs> yep. Uh, could it be A? And uh, no, but you get a goodie. <laughs> <laughs> it's B, actually. Why? And here, this is just a naming, uh, a naming problem, just like for drawables. When you call detach, it doesn't, it is not bound to uh, on attach or undetach. There is nothing in common between on detach and on attach callback with the um, uh, detach and attach, attach commands from fragment transaction. Actually, when you, when you add, remove, or replace, you will attach, detach the fragment and more. So you will have your on attach, on detach, everything called. But when you use attach and detach from fragment transaction, then it, it, won't, it will only work on the view uh, creation and, and destruction. So only on destroy view and on create view will be destroyed, basically. Just as a quick reminder, also show and hide will just act on the visibility of the fragments view. And you will be uh, called back in a uh, callback call on it and changed. So it's really a, a problem of, of naming here. Notification channel. So this one is pretty new. Uh, so it's not like this what, what the fuck moment I, I didn't have it uh, like a year, years ago. Uh, so this is probably the, the most complex one, but you will see that it's not that complex. So what we do in this, um, in, in this code, we basically get the notification manager. We create a channel that has an ID, a name, and an importance. We set a light color on it. 
then we create the notification channel, we delete it, and we create another one using the same channel ID, a different name, a different importance, and a different light color, and we create a notification channel with that uh, new notification channel. And what do we do at the end is just to display the name, importance, and the light color of that channel. So what would be the possible answers? Would it be A, like a name, three, and basically red? Yeah, I can read hexadecimal uh, stuff like, like this. It's red, uh, which is basically a channel. Would it be B, another name, four, and then green, which is basically another channel? Would it be C, another channel, name and color, but a channel importance? Or would it be uh, D, sorry, another name, three, and red, which would be another name, another channel name, but a channel importance and color. Yeah. Uh, it's A. You get the good D, but it's not A. <laughs> it's D, um, and and actually this is pretty difficult to understand when you look at the documentation, it's not that obvious. So there is two things in here. The first thing is that actually delete notification channel is not really deleting the notification channel. It only hides it. So as you, when you read the documentation, it says that if you delete a notification channel, it would be deleted, but it can be undeleted, okay? And it can be undeleted if you create an, a channel which has the same ID as the channel you've deleted, right? So when you do that, it won't recreate a new channel, it will revive uh, the old channel. So this is the first thing that you have to keep in mind. And then the second thing that you have to keep in mind is that when you modify the fields from that channel, well, you can modify some. Some can be modified under some, some cir certain circumstances, and some can't be modified, right? So if you look at the name and description, it's another name. Why? Because it's always modifiable for localization purpose or if you want uh, the, um, the channel name to reflect what your users uh, want. But if you want to modify the importance, then it's only modifiable if the, import the importance is below the current one and that the, the channel is not modified by the user. The user sorry. So pretty tricky here. If you want to modify the group, it's only possible if the group has never been set, okay? And if you want to modify some, something else, like the sound or the light color, just like, that, just like we've done, or the vibration pattern, you can't do it. So basically what it means is that if, if you really want to modify a channel, well, first, always try to think about your channels, not to make sure that they are future-proof and not required to be modified in the future. But if you want really to modify them, then it's probably a a better idea, or actually it's on your only possibility, is to completely delete it, stop using this ID, create a new ID, and recreate a new channel from that. You will lose all of the, um, the, the, the preferences that have been set by the user, so that's why make sure you do that like pretty, pretty, um, not, not, too, not often. Let's now continue on another puzzler with shared preferences, read and write. This one is fairly simple. We have just a shared preference, then we create an editor, we put uh, a key value uh, associated to key we associate hell, then we open another editor and we associate null to key and we apply it, so apply uh, is called directly on the editor, and then we get this value, passing a default value to he even, heaven, sorry, and then we trust go to what? Will we go A to heaven? Will we go B to hell? Will we go C to no? Or is it A, B, or C? Yes? It will be either A or B. I'll go for hell, go to hell. Go to hell? Yes, B. And no. I'm not saying to you, but I'm out. <laughs> But I can go to hell, I, I, I understand why. Uh, it's go to heaven. So for first, answer D is not possible. Um, most people think about answer D because they read that apply is asynchronous. But the thing is, 
apply is indeed asynchronous and atomic, but it's async to disk. It's not async to memory. So whenever you're doing an apply, it's done synchronously on memory. Okay, so you may have like several apply uh, one after each other. You don't care about about the fact that it's um, uh, applied to the disks asynchronously. In memory, everything will be uh, at the latest value. So it's not the D value. And why uh, do we have like um, Evan and not null? Because actually we've set null to, um, to, to the key. Well, if you read the, the documentation, it says that def value is actually the value that is returned if this preference does not exist. The thing is, define does not exist. And actually, it's not really exactly what it means because new is, consider, is considered as not existing. So whenever you have a key, a key value pair and the value is new, regardless of the, uh, of the value, or, well, the value is always new, but regardless of um, the, the, the dev value that you pass, you will always have the dev value because new is considered as not existing, which is actually kind of weird because the API, well, allows you to pass null. So, yeah, as I said, null values are always considered um, as, as not existing. So expect dev value to be returned whenever you're passing, uh, whenever you have null uh, associated to a key. Let's deep dive into layouts now, and in particular this one, which is like, has been around for several years too, uh, linear layout weight. So the code is fairly simple. We have an activity, I set the activity main, and I add an own layout, a change listener to the linear layout, and I just trace three values, which are the width of the linear layout, and then the width of a first text view, and the width of a second text view. And if I look at the, the definition of this layout, it's just a linear layout, which is horizontal by default. Um, the width is set to 400 dps, so I've set dps here to make it easier to read and not uh, it depends on the density of the device result. So obviously don't use that in, in production. Uh, and then I have a text view which is 300 pixel wide width but a weight of 1 and a second text view which is 200 pixel wide and a weight of 2. So what would be the output for you? Would it be A? 400 pixel, 267, uh, sorry, uh, 133. Would it be B? Well, in that case, the linear layout will grow to, to, to contain all of the children, so 500, 300, 200. Would it be C? 400, 233, and 167. Or would it be D? 400, 300, 200, basically meaning that the, the second text view will be cut because there is no, not enough room. We have here a goodie winner. I hope so. <laughs> you uh, will get one, I'd, don't worry. Let's say um, answer D. Answer D. Yes. I and it's not that. <laughs> Sorry. And that's something that is really counterintuitive because you set explicitly some size to the text view, but actually linear layout will modify the, s the, the, the size that you've passed bas based on the weight of, uh, of, uh, of this text view. So it's, it could be either C or A, uh, and this, this is another thing that is counterintuitive, which is that the one layout that has the biggest weight is supposed to be the, the biggest one, but actually it would be the smallest one, the, the one that is reduced the most. Why? Because if we look at the um, formula that is used internally by the linear layout, it's it, this way, its final width is equal to compute width, computed width, which is basically the width that we've passed to, le, to the, the layout params, plus delta multiplied by weight on weight sum. So in our case, it's the weight sum is three. The delta is is negative actually because we have two children that are 300 and 200, so 500 pixel, but the parent is 400 pixel. So we have minus 100 pixel for the delta, and we multiply it. Um, to get the final width, so that that is pretty pretty weird at the f at first when you um, encounter this behavior uh, at runtime, and it's actually even it can be uh, even weirder in some extreme situation. Like for instance, let's say in the previous example, we switched the linear layout to 100 pixel, then there will be not enough room, and actually the first text view will be 167 pixel. 
But the second one, because of this formula, would be zero dp, zero pixels. So it's really, really uh, funny to look at the, at the result of this. Uh, in general, well, it's possible to pass like a width to a, a weighted child of a linear layout, but in general, we use only uh, the, um, the zero, uh, zero width uh, child, which means that the computed, if you look at the formula, the computed width will be zero. So the final width will be only delta multiplied by weight on weight sum, which is easier to understand and easier what you expect actually something like this uh, at runtime. Let's now focus on local resolution. Um, so here again, we will have to modify a bit the build.gradle file. And what we will do is just to, to set the rest configs to ES. So what it means, just so, so that you know, uh, it means that the build system will strip all of the uh, resources that are not matching this rest configs. So we will have only values dot, uh, dash es and values, of course, the default one is always here. But it's very important to have that, especially in production, because uh, I've seen so many applications not using it. And uh, because you are using third-party libraries that may bring, like, other languages that you're not dealing into, into the application, it may completely break the system local resolution. So al always make sure to, to put that into your, um, into your uh, build.gradle file, especially if you're using, for instance, play services or app compat, which brings a lot of, uh, of local you may not be uh, handling. So let's look at the code. Fairly easy, we set activity main as the content view and retrace local list.get default followed by local.getDefault, followed by the text that is displayed in the UI. Here, to avoid the it depends stuff, uh, just remember that the user's local preference is set to ENUS, FR, FR, and then ES, ES. If we look at the layout, it's just a text view that matched the parent, the gravity center, but we don't really care. It doesn't change anything on the local resolution, hopefully. And finally, the text is L word. And the L word text is obviously defined in two uh, values folder, in the default values folder, where it's set to bonjour monde, and in the values uh, dash ES set to hola mondo. I hope I've pronounced it correctly because I don't know how to speak Spanish. Sorry if I offended you. And uh, here are the possible answers. Would it be A? FR, yes, then FR, then bonjour monde. Would it be B, ENUS, FR, FR, yes, yes, FR, FR, bonjour monde? Would it be C, ENUS, FR, FR, yes, yes, ENUS, sorry, and bonjour monde? Or would it be D, throws a resource not found exception? Here. I think it's answer C. It's answer C. Correct. Nice. And does anybody know why? Uh, because the um, so the get uh, the get defaults so returns the whole list, uh, the first one plus, and the second one, um, even if you limit the the value the locals bundled in the APK, your uh, device still has uh, the same default uh, local, I think, and because uh, bonjour monde is set in the uh, default value strings, it's not stripped. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't get the, uh, the end part. <laughs> the, the, la the, the last part? Yes. The, the uh, bonjour monde is set in the default values yes. uh, slash string.xml, so it's not stripped from the, uh, from the APK. Uh, well, actually, it's never stripped, actually, because default values are never stripped, yes. Hmm. Uh, actually, the, so I let's say we have this configuration then. What would be the answer for you? It would be DED, or would it be FRFR? Would it be yes, yes? Well, would it be default or yes? Actually, the resolution is, is this, this way. So what, what the system will do is, is we'll go through the user settings um, local definition. So first, it will go through the DED uh, group. Okay? So first, it will look at DED. We have no values uh, DED. So it will look at the parent of DED, which is D. And there is no values dash D. 
So it will look at all of the children from D because maybe you are using D slash, uh, well, D underscore CH, uh, CH, sorry. Uh, but in that case, that's not the scenario. So then it will go, so none of them are working. Then it will go to the second user setting. Uh, FR, FR, then FR, then children of FR. And it's not matching either because we have not FR. Default is containing French language, but actually the system doesn't know about it. It's like default values. If you look at ES, then you have a match. And you have a match because, well, you have ES, ES is not matching, but you look at the parent of ES, ES, and you match with ES. So when we look at that, we, we don't understand why we get the default because here we don't have DD, but we have uh, we, had, we don't have ENUS at the uh, primary user settings, but we have DED and still we end up with ES, ES. So why would we end up with ENUS when it is in the users list? So here it will default at, at values ES, but now let's focus on ENUS. And actually that's because the system considers that whenever you have ENUS in your user settings, then it considers that the app is managing or dealing with EN or English, right? So this is something very weird at the beginning because you don't expect that and, and you don't expect to have only English values in default, but starting uh, Android 7, uh, actually this is something that has been modified when they introduced the multiple local resolution. So if we look at this, because the system will, will always consider that the application is handling English whenever the English is used uh, in the user settings, it will go through that and it will pick EN. And it will pick EN, but because there is no default values, um, there is no EN values, sorry, in the app resources, it will default to the default values. So we will end up with Bonjour Monde, but the local will be set to ENUS, which is kind of weird. And it's been 40 minutes, so I thank, thank you for, for, your, um, for, your, for this. Uh, thank you for attending. And if you have any question regarding this or have any other puzzlers, I would be very happy to hear about them. Thank you.